Good day, everyone. I'm your host, Lee Judge, and welcome to today's webinar entitled, How to Easily Make Your IVR Visual, brought to you by Jakarta. Our presenter today is Chris Dutoy, Director of Product Marketing at Jakarta. Today, we will take a quick look at what visual IVR is, how it can improve your customer experience, and see how easily it can be implemented. So let's begin. The presentation is all yours, Chris. Great. Uh, thank you, Lee, for the introduction and uh, coordinating this entire WebEx. Uh, for those of you on the call who were hit by an email or touched by a banner ad in some form, uh, that's Lee behind the, uh, the scenes pulling all the strings and, and getting this all coordinated. So thank you, Lee. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, and thank you for attending. Uh, we know your time is very precious, and so we're happy to introduce our series of 30-minute webinars which aim to be really informative, quick, and more importantly, to the point, so we can give you some time back in your day. Um, there will still be time for Q&A, so even though the webinar is 30 minutes, uh, we have allocated Q&A time. Go ahead and feel free to type in your questions uh, you know, at any time during the during this session. Lee will coordinate getting those answered at the end, and should we run out of time, we will respond to you individually, so don't worry about any time limits. Just go ahead and ask your questions. So our topic today, of course, is visual IVR. And I thought, what better way to start a presentation on IVRs and visual IVRs than to get your reaction at this slide. Thank you for calling. Please listen carefully as our menu options have recently changed. For billing inquiries, please press 1. For account changes, please press 2. For cancellations, please press 3. Does anybody feel good hearing these words being uttered? My, my guess is probably not. And by the way, why have the menu options always recently changed? That kind of reminds me of the store that always has the going out of business sign in the window. I wish the menu options would actually stay the same for once. So it's no secret that IVRs are not our preferred method of communication. We probably even dread hearing these words being uttered every time we call into a, into a call center. But the reality is that IVRs do serve a valuable purpose um, and, and we'll see the value that they bring throughout this presentation, but it's still not our preferred communication method, and we try and avoid the IVR if we at all can. So how do we know if our IVR is not delivering on the experience customers are expecting? Um, these are what I call the warning signs for your IVR, or as I like to put it, the canary in the coal mine, with no offense to any of the bird lovers in our audience. The first warning sign for your IVR, or that what your IVR isn't what it should be, is when your zero out rate is approaching more than 7%. So by zero out, we're referring to those who, once they're on the IVR, they hit zero to just speak to an agent. They don't want to navigate through your IVR tree. And there's no real common industry consensus or average for these zero out rates, but from an out, us speaking to customers, um, it looks like once you approach 7% or higher, you're causing more zero outs than what you should be expecting. There's always going to be some zero outs because no matter what, you're going to have people just hitting zero. No matter how good your IVR is, some people will just hit for, you know, reach for the zero key immediately. Uh, but once this reaches more than 7%, you're really probably causing more zero outs than you need to. Uh, and we've heard stories from some of our customers of zero out rates exceeding 20%. Um, so at certainly at that point, you know there's a warning sign for your IVR. So what's the next warning sign that your IVR isn't functioning as it should? When customers reach an agent, they're already frustrated. It's not a good way to start a customer interaction. You funnel in through some confusing menu trees, maybe with poor voice recognition, and by the time they reach you, they're already upset. So you have to ask yourself if the benefits of that IVR system is that exceeding the negative customer experience. And now your agent has to deal with an upset customer, uh, the interaction's not off to a good start, and you've added to your average handle time while you spend a few minutes trying to calm the customer down. A third sign that your IVR is in trouble, when the percentage of call transfers inside your call center is excessive. This is a sign of poor menu choices. So your customer ends up in the wrong queue, and the moment your agent answers, they have, that customer has to be transferred to another queue. So keep an eye on your internal transfer rate. If these are getting excessive, you might need to look at your menu options uh, and see why people are ending up in the wrong queue. 
And a fourth sign, how your warning sign might be in trouble, and by this time I think the canary is well and dead. Your website is listed on sites instructing callers how to zero out. Yes, there really are websites that exist that sole purpose in life is to tell your customers how to bypass your IVR. They give you the sequence of DTMF tones that you have to dial so you can just immediately get to an agent and not struggle in an IVR tree. There's many of these sites and many of the uh, larger, more well-known companies will find themselves listed on these sites. Uh, so obviously I say this somewhat facetiously, but it's not a good sign when your customers are actually trying to bypass your IVR. And our most important warning sign that your IVR is in trouble, when you don't want to call your own call center, then you really have a problem with your IVR. Uh, and anecdotally, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had my internet uh, connectivity at my house was out, so I called the cable repair. Um, they came out, the technician came out to my house, um, of course missed the appointment window, but nonetheless finally came to my house. Uh, the root cause was that my modem was, was uh, shot and they had to give me a new cable modem. So he provided me a new cable modem, and with the new cable modem, he has to provision it. So he has to, you know, he told me he has to phone tech support to provision my new modem, and I thought, no problem. Believe it or not, that tech support actually phones the same 1-800 number that you and I dial when we have a problem, and that poor technician had to sit through the IVR tree uh, trying to find his way through the IVR tree, uh, ultimately with a long hold time, and believe it or not, bounced when he finally reached an agent because he was in the wrong department for that. Um, and, and that's somebody who, who does, you know, does this multiple times a day, uh, and he was he was quite frankly, he was cursing and he was more visibly upset than I think I've ever been. So when you don't want to call your own call center, it's time to maybe reassess your IVR situation. So let's be clear and let's be fair. The IVR is not the actual problem. The IVR serves a very valuable purpose. And, and really it starts out with the best of intentions. And your IVR team works very hard to keep it as an efficient self-service and routing engine uh, for your company. But often they're just tasked with too much. You know, then marketing want to add a promotion in the beginning few minutes. Um, you know, uh, somebody in charge of operations might, might want to act more of a call deflection to, to lower the cost. Um, and, and customer care want more information collected to try and reduce the, the whole time. So your IVR ends up getting tasked with so much that sometimes it just doesn't hang together as well as you thought it might. Um, so it's not that people hate IVR self-service. They hate bad self-service, and there is a distinction. So what are the common signs of a bad uh, experience? And this slide was actually one of the easiest slides that I could put together, because I bet if I asked just about anybody on this phone, what don't they like when they phone into a customer care organization, I think we would all probably come up with pretty much the same set of results that I have here. If you have any hot button items or ones that you think are particularly annoying that I don't cover, feel free to send it to us in the chat session and, and uh, we can we can share it with the group afterwards. But I think we'll we'll all sort of see this one together. Um, the first the first thing we hate when we're forced to listen to long introductory prompts. Sometimes you see so many things crammed into that first minute, um, including trying to upsell somebody when you don't even yet understand why they're calling. And, and trust me, when I'm calling back for the third time with the same problem, you better understand me first before trying to upsell me or to advertise to me because I'm not receptive at that moment to receiving that upsell or advertising. You have an upset customer on call, don't force me through this long uh, one-minute, two-minute introductory prompt, um, and please don't tell me your many options have changed. The next thing we hate about bad self-service is when the menu options are so long, you can't remember which one you should have chosen. In this generation of Twitter, we consume 140 characters at a time. So by the seventh menu option, I honestly don't remember the first three. Maybe that's unique to me, uh, the short attention span. But sometimes when you've used up all nine, nine digits of DTMF to explain your menu options, uh, I, I've forgotten what the first two were. I don't write them down, and I don't remember which one was better than the other. Our third reason why we hate bad self-service is when the menu options are confusing. Should I choose three 
No, wait, two. Yes, two was the one. No, it wasn't the right choice. Besides, what is the difference between account services and account inquiries? Which one should I push? Make your menu options clear so that it's very obvious which one I choose and that I don't end up in the wrong queue and that I don't end up with an internal bounce. Our fourth reason why we hate bad self-service. No clear navigation path. How do I get back? I'm four menus down. This is the wrong branch I'm in. Let me try star. No, that took me back to the beginning. Very frustrating. How do I go back one menu option? Why did that one take me back to the top menu option and I have to start all over again? Give me a very cl clear and concise navigation path. Don't let me play around trying to figure out what the right path is. Remember, this is not a website. I don't have a visual breadcrumb to know where I'm at. So when you couple four menu levels deep with nine menu options on each level, uh, it really is a recipe for disaster. And here is my number one personal pet peeve on bad self-service, and I'm pretty sure this is going to resonate with many people on the call. Why should I enter anything in here when the first thing you're going to do when I connect is you're going to ask me for that information again? It is so annoying when we enter our account number and our verification number and our billing zip code, and then the first thing the agent asks us is, may I please have your account number again? Please, either fix your screen pop or don't ask me for the information in the first place. Very, very annoying, and I think that resonates with many, many people on the call today. So the question you'll often hear is, isn't the IVR dying? Um, and really, the answer is absolutely not. Um, it is very important. You know, we, we find companies continue to invest in the IVR. It does serve a very valuable purpose. We've seen very well-designed IVR trees, and we've seen poorly designed IVR trees, just as you have good websites and bad websites. Um, so certainly, the IVR isn't dying. There are a couple of trends that we've noticed, um, and this is really as we canvass the marketplace, as we talk to various customers, um, and these are trends and predictions that I'd just like to share with you. The, the first trend um, and prediction, social media will not replace the IVR. Uh, it's very easy to get swept away by this craze of social media, believing it's going to be this magic pill that will make all your problems go away. Um, but in reality, we see very little adoption of social media in, in the customer service place. Uh, which might sound contrary to everything you're reading where the buzzword is social media, what we see social media being used on a day-to-day -day basis is more for reputation management. Companies are monitoring their Twitter streams, monitoring their Facebook streams. They're looking for negative postings about their company or service um, and then trying to do some brand or reputation management. We've seen very little social media in the way of actually uh, being a customer service channel. Obviously, this will change but uh, we don't see social media replacing your IVR anytime uh, in the near future. Second trend and prediction, the demand for multi-touch point will increase, so what we call the two Cs, the C standing for consistency and continuity. Um, from a consistency perspective, as a customer, I expect to have the same information regardless of how I'm touching your organization. If I'm on your website and you tell me that it's a two-year contract, um, and then if I speak to an agent on the phone, I don't want to be told it's an 18-month contract or a one-year contract. I need that consistent information regarding on the touch point or channel that I'm coming into your organization. Um, and the second C outside of consistency is the continuity. Um, I, I need to be able to start my interaction in one channel, such as, for example, you know, maybe I start a reservation process on the website in the morning before work. I then jump in my car and I call into the call center and I want to continue that reservation. I want continuity of my transaction. I don't want to start from the beginning. And obviously with something like continuity across touch points with your voice being your, your sort of end point, uh, the IVR is going to play a fundamental role in helping solve this continuity equation. So uh, again, this is going to just uh, emphasize the, the need for the IVR, but just make sure that we strengthen the IVR and, and make sure your IVR uh, adapts to this multi-touch point shift that we're going to see with consumers. Our third IVR trend, uh, the next generation of IVRs will need to emphasize self-service. And it's no secret that one of the primary IVR uh, sort of 
you know, impetus is, is that it's call deflection, trying to avoid that inbound call to the call center. The problem right now is with the earlier generation of implementations of call deflection is that it feels like that for a customer. It feels like you're trying to deflect my call, that you don't want to talk to me, versus being a very helpful self-service channel. So although, of course, we want to avoid inbound calls, it's the primary cost driver, um, it can't just be a routing engine, and it can't just be for collecting some basic information. It needs to become an effective self-service channel. IVRs that don't adapt to become an effective self-service channel uh, will risk sort of being uh, deprecated and, and losing place to, to websites, chat, and, and other social media channels. So we will see IVRs needing to adapt and become effective self-service uh, channels. Voice XML will become the standard. This is what IVRs typically use uh, internally to, you know, how you design your call trees, and it's known as Voice XML or VXML. This will become the standard. Newer IVRs already support it. Legacy ones will have to support it. Uh, it is or will be the de facto standard. So if you are looking at IVR, IVR replacement cycles, you may want to look at the, the VXML support that they provide, but we see this becoming more and more prevalent. Um, and then, unfortunately, this is part of our IVR trend and prediction. No matter what we do, um, some people will still always claim to, quote, hate the IVR just because it's become so entrenched in our psyche. If you looked at my opening slide about Please listen carefully. Our menu options have changed. I think uh, we, we've come to expect to hear that almost on every call. So uh, it's going to take a, a while before we can actually shift people's perceptions away from this um, and, and start really changing the overall perception and feeling of what an IVR is. And mobile doesn't really help the problem. You might be saying, well, everybody's on a mobile device now, um, but that doesn't help the problem. Actually, it just exacerbates the problem. Uh, think about how it is to talk uh, to an IVR system when you're using your mobile device. I dial the number, I put the phone up to my ear, I push one for English, I then have to turn, you know, back the phone, look at the, the right menu option to push the next key, put it back to my ear and listen to the next menu tree. Um, it, it's, a, it's a lot of back and forth and it just doesn't lend itself well um, to, to the mobile mindset. Um, even those that use voice recognition don't often work that well because the very nature of the mobile phone means I'm probably roaming somewhere, I'm in my car, I'm at the airport, there's a lot of background noise um, and you keep getting, the voice recognition keeps getting interrupted or doesn't understand you. Uh, or if you have an accent, where it can't pick up or determine your accent. So voice recognition is not necessarily the cure either on the mobile mindset. Um, and so what happens, once again, it's just easier to zero out than to navigate that tree. So what are the goals here? The, the goals are to channel more of these calls into an effective self-service offering. Call deflection does remain. We're not naive. We know we need to deflect these calls. We want to reduce inbound calls. That is cost savings. So we want to channel these into a more effective self-service offering. For those calls that do come in, we want to know more about them and what they want, and we just want to decrease the overall amount of zero outs. And this is the solution, something we call visual IVR. And it provides an easy-to-use visual interface based off of your IVR so that you can drive the proven benefits of your IVR onto the mobile and the web and that web part is quite important. I'll talk about it in a, in a minute. So what your users have now is they will see your IVR instead of hearing your IVR, all in a convenient menu-driven approach. And best of all, this even allows you to navigate back to a previous option. So when I'm four levels down in that call tree and I realize this is not where I want to be, I don't have to fumble and wonder how I get back. I simply conveniently hit the back button to the level that I need to be and carry on my transaction. So touching your way through your menu options is far more convenient than listening to audio prompts. Just as can be shown on this diagram, you know, I click reservations, new flight reservations, and I'm done. I didn't listen to five menu options across two tree levels. And it integrates to your website, too. Um, if you take a minute to think about how our customers are going to contact your organization, um, there's a good chance they're going to hit Google and just search for your company name to get your contact link on your website, 
or they might already be on your self-service website and they reach that point where they think they need to speak to somebody. So either way, the web is a big channel into your organization and there's a good chance they're going to use a contact link or a I need help now button on your self-service website. So Visual IBR can actually be embedded in your website so you can start the call routing right there on your website before that connection to the call center happens. Um, on, a, on a slightly technical level, this is rendered in HTML5, so embedding Visual IVR uh, where you want to is quite an easy task for your IT folk uh, to get that done. So think of the fact that you've not taken your IVR, you've made it visual, and you've projected it onto both smartphones and onto your website. So you've really extended the availability of your IVR into some additional channels. It also allows visual-only IVR extensions. So you can actually enter alphanumeric data, something which, of course, is very difficult to do in a conventional IVR. Just try entering your email address using DTMF dialing. And again, no repeating of information. It ties into your screen pop, and you can actually get a full interaction history to see what that person did throughout the entire uh, sort of visual IVR session. So when that call does come in, the agent knows what the call is about, and you're not asking for that repeating of information, and you've got a, a much happier customer as a result. So overall, visual IVR delivers a better experience. Um, you know, listening or, or, or scanning a, a list of, of smartphone instructions much quicker than listening to a list of instructions, lower number of zero outs, and it's not uncommon for that introductory prompt and menu to be over one minute. Uh, we've called a couple of these and we've listened to them and, and sure enough, they can take over one minute of explaining before I even get to choose my menu option. So scanning that screen of menu options is certainly far more convenient. So looking at how, that is, how does it work, uh, this slide is not meant to be a technical slide, it really is sort of architecture, but it is important to understand that IVRs today that use VXML uh, to write these call trees, take that VXML and they sort of drive that as audio prompts on your phone. So you push one for billing, two for you know, account inquiries, or, or zero to speak to an operator. Uh, and that's what your IVR is probably using today. Visual IVR takes those same VXML scripts that your IVR is using and dynamically at runtime renders this as a visual interface for your phone. So the key takeaway here is that you don't have to write new scripts. You can immediately adopt Visual IVR on top of your existing IVR system. So you don't have to create a new set of scripts. You don't have to maintain two scripts. Um, you've got a very way, convenient way of literally almost plugging and playing to be up and running with Visual IVR. Um, if you don't use VXML, we have, you know, we support additional technologies. For example, if you're on Avaya, um, you're probably using Dialog Designer, uh, where we provide plugins for that, so you can easily take your Avaya IVR scripts and also convert them to Visual. And uh, we'll certainly, you know, anybody wants to have a follow-up to see how we could work with your IVR, by all means. So. The business case for this is actually is pretty clear, and, and oftentimes you have to choose between something that's good for your customer or something that's good for your business, um, and, and this one actually is good for your customers and your business. It really is a win-win scenario. It's easy visual navigation for your customer. We like touching our way through the IVR, just scanning menu options and not listening to those audio trees. We really, really, really like not having to repeat information. Um, and it's just a much better customer service with reduced call times for us. On the business side, it's dramatically reduced costs because you're really not taking the IVR and making it an effective self-service channel because um, people are less inclined to just zero out because they'll actually try and resolve their issue themselves now on their phone. And also you're lowering your IVR and telephony charges because you're not keeping somebody in the IVR system for two minutes while paying those 1-800 telephony charges. So you're saving on the telephony charges as well. You're saving on reduced call times for the calls that do come in because you have that rich screen pop. Um, and again, you have an easy implementation because you're reusing your existing IVR scripts. You're not embarking on a big IT initiative to be up and running with a visual IVR. So as promised, we said it was quick, concise, and to the point as part of our 30-minute visual IVRs. You can read more about Visual IVR by visiting that URL that I have on the screen here, www.visual-ivr.com. But more importantly, 
what I would really encourage you to do is if you want to see what visual IVR looks like on your IVR system to get a real sense of what it's like, why don't you just uh, go to that site. Uh, you'll see there's a request a demo link or a contact us link. Feel free to fill that out. It's no obligation. We'd be happy to show you how visual IVR can work with your IVR. Um, and sometimes, you know, a picture paints a thousand words. It's really much better to see what your customers might experience uh, to get a feel for it than just uh, sort of, you know, taking our word for it. So please just uh, visit that website and uh, request, uh, request for us to show you a, a personalized demo. So with that, we've got a few minutes left. I want to turn it back to Lee so we can get into some questions and answers. So Lee, please take it. Okay, thank you again, Chris, for your valuable insights. That's some really exciting uh, information there about Visual IVR. Uh, we've ha we have a very high attendance today, and we have a lot of questions coming in. So that's a good sign that Visual IVR is something that people are really interested in. Uh, let's go to our question window. If you haven't done so yet, uh, we have a Q&A window. You can type your questions in the Q&A window, and we'll do our best to answer them what we can right now, but then uh, time is short, so we'll uh, respond to you via email for the ones we can't answer right now. Um, let's see, the first one I see, Chris, uh, says, do you really think inbound call volume will be reduced? Uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, you know, the short answer is, you know, absolutely. Um, if, but we've got to be clear, if your IVR is not an effective self-service solution today, then just switching to a visual IVR solution might not change that. Um, you know, we, we have to make sure that your IVR um, offers self-service solutions, but absolutely, once that is visual, people are much more likely to do it. They don't want to just zero out, um, and especially if you add this to, the, to, your, to your website, then you're going to capture an entire new audience of people who are more inclined to do the self-service aspect of your IVR. Okay, so you, you mentioned the website. Here's a question that's uh, in the uh, Q&A window. Let me read it to you. It says, the customer has to start the conversation out of the web browser? That's your question. Um, or is it possible to start with a normal call and push the visual IVR menu to get to the for, for the customer? I guess. Uh, great question. Yeah, there's a couple of ways you can actually do this. Uh, we don't anticipate actually starting uh, the voice session from the web browser. the The website will be used to provide the self service aspect of this, or to get to the right department. Um, and at that time, then to initiate the call. If you're using a VoIP client, you can try and establish a VoIP connection. Um, alternatively, what we will do is um, really pre-alert the IVR that a call is going to come in that's been pre-screened and pre-routed. So once the call connects, we will then connect you uh, immediately uh, to the right agent in the right queue. So can this be used both on the mobile device and on the web? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's see, another question we have here. Um, a couple of questions about uh, VXML and XML. So what if your IVR doesn't already use XML? Uh, we, we chose VXML just because most of the IVR players are standardizing on it or have standardized on it. Um, but we certainly recognize that many of you don't yet have VXML. Um, we, we do work with many formats. So what we would encourage if you don't use VXML, just reach out to us and we'll, we'll see how we can work with your IVR. Um, and for example, with Avaya, uh, which is of course a big IVR player, we have plugins to their designer with the uh, the Dialog designer to make it very easy to to work with with those kind of companies. Okay, let's see. Um, this person says we use uh, pre-recorded voice prompts in our IVR tree. So how do you uh, how do you what do you do about those? Um, I'm guessing that the 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 the, uh, the, the, the attendee is talking about. Um, not using text to speech when you've actually got audio files in your IVR. So it's not uncommon to see this. Um, in cases like this, what we typically do is a one time mapping exercise so we can map your voice prompts to the visual IVR display text. Uh, this is really a quick one time effort, and we still re reuse all your existing IVR flows so that you're not recreating your flows, you're just creating this mapping table or translation table as a, as a one time exercise. Okay, um, let's see, one more question here because our time is, is growing short. Um, someone asked, does this work on English only or what about multiple languages? Oh, it, it absolutely works with uh, multiple languages. Um, we're not concerned ourselves with the actual language and, and what I mean is we don't try to pause the audio prompts. We're going to use whatever your current VXML scripts work and I, I think the key takeaway to, to for the audience here is um, 
we will do a one-for-one -one mapping with your IVR uh, really automatically. So we'll take your existing IVR scripts and present it visually. It doesn't matter what the language is of the IVR. Okay. Um, I have a few more questions here, Chris. I'll text them over to you. Do you see any ones we can get as our closing question because uh, we need to wrap up here? Um, I, I see Ron has asked uh, what kind of cost should we anticipate um, and, and just to echo and Lee, before I answer that, we got uh, actually an overwhelming number of questions, so uh, we apologize about that, but we will certainly get back to you uh, via email individually. Um, Ron had asked about the cost to expect. The, the pricing um, is, is designed to sort of be a, a, a net replacement for the IVR transaction cost. So you would find it's not a, a, a net new budgetary increase because as you avoid calls in the IVR, uh, as they use visual IVR, the, the cost differential uh, should be there so that it's sort of not a net new cost. Um, so you can look at uh, either per transaction pricing or concurrent session pricing, um, and certainly if there's any interest, just uh, shoot us an email and we'll get back to you. Okay, great. Um, well, that concludes our webinar today, How to Easily Make Your IVR Visual. Uh, thanks again to Chris Dutoy, our Director of Product Marketing. If there are any questions that we were unable to answer during today's session, we will respond directly to you after the, after the event. Uh, we hope that you have gained valuable insight into Visual IVR and how to easily uh, utilize it to enhance your organization's IVR. A replay of the event will be available soon on jakarta.com. And if you'd like a copy of the slide decks, please contact me directly at ljudge at jakarta.com. Uh, once again, thank you for attending today. Please visit us at jakarta.com and also visual-ivr.com. And have a wonderful day.